There we go, Rick. What's up, dude? Man, nothing. Like I said, thank you so much for for doing this. I am a I'm a big fan. Like following you, I love BMX stuff. Um, but what I really like inspires me about you, which is what like prompt me to really want to have you on the podcast. Is you make these posts about being like a certain age, and you're still ripping, and then you're a lead singer in a punk rock band, and then you just get into stand up comedy. Like I'm I'm. I'm blown away by your lack of fear in like age and what you do and profession and where you come from and all that stuff. Man, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, man, I don't know where to start. I, I guess like, I mean, I guess I'll start with just like, it all came from probably riding bikes, you know? Like, like when you like, when you like write stuff down on a piece of paper and you bring it to life, strictly because you think you want to do it, like, I'm going to try this, and there's no, like, opportunity, there's no, or there's very few opportunities, and no one really knows about the sport, but you're, like, writing tricks down, and, like, it's all you're thinking about, it's something that you want to do, and you overcome fears, like, you, you by, by doing that, or, like, you get hurt, and what I'm getting at is, is, like, like, let's say if you get hurt, you got to, like, overcome, you know, you got to be like, all right, I got to overcome that injury, Mentally, physically, like, all right, you know, brush it off, keep it moving. And so, like, when I go into other things and other projects or other dreams of mine that I wanted to do as a kid, uh, I always compare it to bike riding. Because I'm like, well, like, okay, I want to go do stand-up comedy. What's the worst that could happen? People don't laugh? All right, then figure it out. You know what I mean? And then be like, and then like, okay, how many times did you slam riding on your bike before you pull the trick. But once you got that trick, bam, then you perfected it. So it's kind of like the same mentality, you know, like whether it's the music or like any, anything that you want to do. And I was lucky enough to find bike riding and learn the, that, that, uh, I don't know, like that, not like work ethic, but like, you know, just learn how to like overcome fears, set goals, write it down, believe in yourself. There ain't nobody else there but you and that pen and that pad. And then I, you know what I'm saying? So, like, that's kind of like how I approach everything is, is that comp- I literally compare it to bike riding, man. It's crazy. Well, what, you know, I, just, man, I totally get that. Like, it, it makes, it makes sense to me. I mean, being involved, like, I rode BMX for a while, no, nowhere near to the level, you know, but I've loved action sports the whole way. Like, right now, you may laugh. I, I rollerbladed. I was in like one X Games, so it wasn't any big deal. But uh, like, it's the action sports world has taught me so much in my life. Like as a human, growing up as an adult and everything. And so when I see stuff like yours, I'm I'm like, you've taken it so much further than you know in your life. And there's so many like, there's very few guys that have just decided like, hey, I'm just gonna keep doing it. Yeah. Well. Uh, dude, check it out. And that, that's rather you rode and, and you're in the exchanges and all that, man. You do all your stuff. Do what you got to do. You know what I mean? Do what you love. That's what I always tell people. Do what you love to do. You know what I mean? But I learned I learned a long time ago that, like, okay, I have a personality uh, and, to utilize, and to, to utilize that. So in order for me to keep riding, it's like, okay, is my riding, like, the best? Nowadays, it's going to be, like, the best video part. You know, the video age. We didn't have that growing up. I'm, I'm, I'm 51, bro. We didn't have, like, if you had a video camera, you were, like, rich. You know what I'm saying? Like, you didn't, we didn't have it. And and if you had a, a, no one ever had a camera. I wish we would have had a buddy to shop photos. But we never really had any photos, you know? And so what I'm getting at is that in order to, to, to keep to keep doing it back in the day, it was like, okay, what's your contest placing? What place did you get? And that assessed your value. You know what I mean? And so, as that goes on, and you do that for 25 years, I'm like, is this what I'm going to do my whole life? And be like that guy that just competes his whole life and then and then doesn't have any actual life? Like, what? I want to keep riding. You know, like, if, if I don't place good, then I don't have a value. Well, fuck, I know I have a value. Like, and so that's when I started to explore other stuff. And stuff started to come my way, man. Like, hosting TV shows and radio shows and shit like that. And then, and then I got into movies. And then I just kept, but I always, like I said, I would always go back to like, okay, even though I'm hosting a TV show, I used to do a show for ESPN for like four years or something called X Today, but I never stopped riding because 
that was just a way for me to keep riding because the industry dollars from BMX aren't as lucrative as people think. It's all the other stuff. The touring and the appearances and the other sponsors and the, you know, it isn't so much from the BMX root industry of how pro bike riders make the money. They make some money. I'm not saying that some dudes aren't sponsored by the bike bike sponsors, but the majority of, of money for them to, to take care of a family and be 50 and still ride a bike isn't solely just from the bike industry. Sponsorship-wise, no way. You got to go do other shit. You know what I mean? So... That's yeah. why I kind of started doing other stuff. I started doing other stuff because I was like, well, I do want to ride forever, but I don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is I didn't want to be like that competitive pro just straggling along for, for 50 years and that's as good as it gets. Like, no, I wanted more. I wanted to do something more. I wanted to, and I wanted to take what I learned with bike riding and challenge myself to do other stuff. And no disrespect if you are that rider where you want to compete your whole life. That's your path. That just wasn't mine. You know what I mean? Like, 25 years of competing, I felt like, damn, I competed a pretty long time. You know what I mean? <laughs> dude, dude. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's such a long time to be competing in such a violent sport. 100%. And we, we're doing it back in the day when, you know, you know, bro, come on. You, what, you from Texas? Yes, from sir. Texas? All right, so, the freaking, uh, well, where in Texas you come? I, I live in College Station, but I grew up right there on, like, you know where South Padre Island is? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I grew up. Well, the reason I ask is we did a lot of stuff down in Texas back in the day. We used to do the Texas State Fair in Dallas, and it was me, Hoffman, McCoy, Mira, Jay Mira, and Taj uh, We did that shit for five years, dude. We used to do four shows. This is what I'm trying to get out. We used to do four shows a day at the Texas State Fair. And I and, and I got a hundred dollars a day when I rode, and fifty dollars a day when I announced. <laughs> now we're busting ass, dude. The level of riding, me, Hoffman, Mira, McCoy, Miron, like all the top pros. So like we're not just pussy footing around bullshitting and shit. We're throwing it down, and it's like you're throwing it down for like twenty five bucks a show, bro. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> You know, and so you learn, though. You learn, you learn, like, there's a lot you get from doing shows, too. But anyhow, what I'm trying to say is, you mentioned a violent sport. Yeah. And back then, yeah, if you got hurt, it's like, yeah. Uh, you're making, the only, you're living off this show money. You ain't doing the shows, you ain't eating. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was crazy. But it was fun, but it was crazy. You know? Yeah. And what makes it even, what makes that even more crazy is you're doing it for that dollar amount. And I don't think people... People may not 100% realize, if, if you want to check it out, go to Rick's Instagram and scroll back. He has one where he's in the hospital. You can just see all of his injuries. I, like The hospital one blew me away when I saw you. Like You were in there. You were walking around. You were actually going to go ride the ramp, I think you said, right? Again? Wait, what, you're talking about last year? Yeah. Dude, check this story out. So we're doing this show of bands. It's, I, I'm just going to ramble if that's cool. No, check go it for it. Last Okay, last Warp Tour, I did fucking so many Warp Tours, Dan's like, we'd be Warp Tour, but it's only like for a weekend. All right, cool, this is the very last one. Like, they did they did two events last year, and this is the second event. This was like the first day of the event, and, uh, man, I hooked you up on the ramp. I don't know uh, how, uh, honestly. Uh, I didn't do anything hard. It was just like an X-Up setup there. Um, part of me wants to feel like, you know, I don't know, this shit happens, you know what I mean? But anyhow, I ended up knocked out. Like, what the hell just happened? And so my ribs hurt like shit, and I was like, damn. So at the time, I didn't have health insurance. So everybody's like, yo, you should go to the hospital. I'm like, fuck that. I just broke a rib. I'm fine. Well, I, I was, you're gnarly. No, I just broke a couple ribs. I ain't going to do shit for it anyway. So I stayed up all night. We went out. We hung out. We got dinner. I'm wobbling around. I couldn't lay down. I figured if I lay down on the bed with broken ribs, I ain't gonna be able to get out of the bed. I ain't gonna be able to pick myself up. So I slept just sitting up. And the morning came. Everybody's gonna go do the demos. I couldn't go, so I'm like, I'm just gonna stay here. I don't wanna fucking hang out there all day. Be sore. So I'll just catch up with you guys later. Anyways, they gotta, I don't wanna drag this out, but I'm just trying to get all these details. No, go for it, man. So, as long as you want. Okay. So then we're like, okay, cool. I get an Uber to the warp tour because I'm just feeling like, oh, man, I feel like I'm just, just, 
maybe something's wrong with my shoulder, my ribs. Uh, I've felt this before. Uh, keep in mind, I stayed up pretty much all night and uh, just charged through it and just, just being me. And, uh, yeah, man, so, like, I get to the, to the work tour, and I, I don't take any pain medicine. Um, never have. Uh, I can't say I never have, but I hadn't for years. Like, I'm talking, like, 10, 15-plus years. I don't take any medicine, nothing. And uh, I said, man, I got to fly home tomorrow, which is Monday. I want to see if I could just get some, some type of painkillers just to tie me over on that plane ride. going to suck. I just want to get home. Okay? Well, I couldn't breathe. Like, I'm walking with the owner of the Warp Tour. His name's Kevin Lyman, and he's walking normal. And I'm like, Kevin, I can't keep up with you. He's like, what? I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm out of breath. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, I just can't breathe. Turns out, long story short, I said Warp Tour a little longer, and finally I said, okay, I'm going to go to the hospital. I go to one hospital, and they're like, yo, we can't work on you here, dude. I'm like, what? We have to use another hospital. All right, show them to another hospital. There's like eight people ready, waiting for me at the loading dock with the IV ready, just throwing me down. I'm like, let's go, move up. I felt like I was like in war, you know, where like my legs like blown off. Like, get him out, get him out, chopper, let's go, Tommy. I'm like, what's going on? You guys are fucking more, you're freaking out. I'm like, damn, what are y'all tripping on? Uh, Hold on a second. Anyways, okay. And so, so, so then I was like, shit. So, man, so, so as, as they can put the IV in me and like, they're drugging me up, I'm like, yo, you guys still haven't told me what the fuck's going on. And the dude goes, you have blood in your lungs. And I went, whoa, and I was out. <laughs> so this one, turned, this, this, this one turned out, me, the Clint Eastwood, I'll walk it off guy. Stayed up all night, did all that shit. I ended up having seven broken ribs, a broken clavicle, a fractured T2 vertebrae, and two liters of blood was in my right lung. Now, if you know anything about blood in your body, you have about four to five liters of blood in your body tops. So that means half of my blood in my body was filled up one lung. Um, I was like, oh shit, so what it is, they took the blood out of the lung and put it back in my body. Like they filtered it, some shit. They, they had to, because I was like, but I felt normal though. The thing was, is that I just felt like I couldn't breathe. And the, the, the doctor's like, yo, if you would have got on that plane Monday, you would have died because your cabin pressure, you would have just choked on your own blood and shit. I was like, damn. So I felt pretty like blessed, you know, but like I have, I have health insurance now, but like that was gnarly because the artery in my lung gave out on the impact of the slam. But I've slammed so many times in my life. And people say, yeah, you're getting older. Yeah, but I'm a tough son of a bitch. And we've been doing this a long time. Like, I get it. And, like, I blame that shit because I was vaping at the time, dude. Like, like I was vaping uh, for about three years. And I wasn't vaping weed. I was vaping nicotine. But I blame that shit on vaping, bro. 100%. Really? Uh, well, just because I heard, I did some research in the hospital. And here's why. They come, the doctors come in, they go, hey, we got this one chest tube, we got to put another chest tube behind in the back of your lung. I'm like, what the fuck for? He's like, there's a bunch of liquid back there that's not blood. I'm like, wait, what? He goes, yeah, it's usually you find that in older people. Uh, you know, they may get sick, they may get liquid in their lungs, it creates, kills, kills people, you know, it's been, it's what happens, unfortunately. You know, and I'm like, shit. And so I'm like, well, let me ask you something. Could that shit be from vaping? He's like, ah, I can't say yes or no. He's like, why do you ask? I said, well, I did some research, and it turns out that supposedly, you know, I don't believe everything you read, but like vaping, you know, uh, weakens blood vessels and arteries and shit. Now, I started thinking like, eh, I wasn't trying to find an excuse for the injury. Like, shit happens. It's done. Okay? It, it is what it is. But I started thinking like, I saw a lot in my life, and I've never, ever had an artery give out in my lung, bro. You know? So... Uh, I asked him if that was the case, and, uh, and you know, he said, oh, I, I, I don't know. And so right then I was just like, uh, I'm going to quit vaping. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I don't know anything about the vaping world. Like, I, mean, I don't do anything. I never smoked or anything like that. But that's, that's wild that it can create that liquid in your lungs and that it might have, like, weakened things where, like, you think from that impact it just weakened it enough to feel, like, Fill yeah. it up like that? 
I think so because look, man, I don't pride myself in falling, but shit happened, and I'm a pretty positive, optimistic dude. Doesn't take any pain at the time, you know. I, my whole life, I, I don't. Right now, I, I have a CBD sponsor uh, called Neuro XPF that helps me with pain, but I always just dealt with pain naturally, uh, and I feel like CBD uh, helps deal with pain in a, in a more of a natural way than a pharmaceutical way. So I was never into the pharmaceuticals at all. Uh, I just felt like there were just a bunch of chemicals, and that it was just. Not good for me, you know. I, never, I don't know. I just wasn't. I saw people get addicted to shit and stuff. So, but you know, I was over it. But yeah, like so. With the research that I that I did, is I was like, well, you know, like, you know, they're gonna they're gonna say, you know, to do these studies about vaping and stuff. And like, maybe it's true, you know. And in my case, I kind of felt like, well, even if it's not true, and it wasn't from vaping, well, it doesn't hurt to stop, you know. It's like. Not like it's, you know, I'm not. I'm not here to tell people what to do. I'm just saying for me, like, oh, maybe I'll just stop. And and so, yeah, it was just it was just weird because I just felt like, how can my body become that weak when and and no one in the in the whole sport of BMX that I've ever heard of is slammed hard enough to where an artery gave out in their lung. That's saying a um, lot. That is saying a whole lot. <laughs> because there's a lot of dudes that slam pretty fucking hard all the time. And, and I'm like, uh, and, and then the extra liquid in the lung, because I heard about popcorn lung and it creates this stuff. And like, so I just figured I just quit all in all. And I did last December and, uh, I haven't smoked or vaped since. And I don't, you know, uh, that's something I, I smoke. I smoked for like, man, I smoked for a long time in my life, but I didn't start. So I was like in my late thirties, dude, it's crazy. Wow. That's, and, a, that's late to get started on the smoking gig. Yeah, uh, telling me, dude. And so, so then just, you know, not to get too into like making us about smoking and shit, but like basically I just said, you know what, I'm just going to quit. Uh, I, I like breathing, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I think it took, maybe it took something like that for me to quit. I don't know. But, but, but I walked it off. And so what happened was after that surgery, it wasn't really like a surgery. I was just like lay in bed for 12 days. And if you've ever been in a hospital, it's fucking, they don't let you rest. Every hour they're coming in, you need to take this medicine. Okay, and they come back in an hour later. Oh, we gave you that medicine, it creates diarrhea, so you gotta take this medicine. And they go, no, we need a blood sample. I'm trying to sleep. Oh, no, we need a urine sample. It's like, can you leave me the fuck alone? And they're like, ah, oh, the food sucks. And like, oh, like, golly gee. And then like, and then you're just like, and you try to watch TV and they're all pre-recorded shows with like cops and Jerry Springer and all this shit to give you anxiety. I'm like, fuck, what am I doing up here? Ah! Help me! Ah, I hate the hospital. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's exactly why. For me, I'm speaking for me. I ain't speaking for anybody else. That's exactly why. For me, I'm like, I ain't going to the hospital because I know what it's like there. It's miserable. And if all I felt like at the time was all I did was break a rib, I don't need to go. You ain't gonna do anything for a broken rib. Now, I'm glad I went, because I, I would have died. I know. I'm just stubborn sometimes. But you got to think to yourself, like, so I got health insurance now, yada, yada, blah, 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 blah you know. But this, that was just a crazy injury. But anyway, so after the injury, I'm like, I'm coming up on 50. And I remember Tony Hawk did a 50 at 50, okay? And that's 50 tricks to 50 years old. No one had ever done it in skating. Well, Tony Hawk did it. At least I know. You know, he's the first one. And so, so then I was like, okay, I'd already started to film my 50 and 50 because I was planning to do it. And I still needed about, I don't know, 15 or so tricks to do. And, uh, so right when I got home from that injury in July, end of July, maybe end of August, I started filming, uh, to get it done by my birthday in October. And, uh, yeah. So my, my mind power was like, heal up get better, you got shit to do, you know, I, I, and listen, man, I know I'm rambling, you haven't asked me one gosh darn question, but I will say this, I believe, and I don't say that, I don't mean this arrogant at all, but I believe that a lot of people don't like their job, or they work jobs where they don't really like it, and if they can get time off, they're stoked, me personally, time off is a nightmare, because I love to ride every day, I love to do my job, I love to go to the events, me missing an event is torturous. So I think with that type of mindset that, that I have, 
he healed quicker. Most people would love to follow unemployment and kick it and get paid to do nothing. Me, I'd go insane. I'd go insane because I need to be doing something. You know what I mean? But, you know, hey, I'm just saying that, like, that, that creates you to heal quicker because you keep setting these daily goals or these long-term goals or year goals, and it's all focused around your job that you love to do. Why would you want to take a day off? Does or that's, that make sense? You no, know, yeah, that's exactly what, like, that's that's what I think all the time. So I just turned 40, right? And right. I do, I still rollerblade, I still do all the same stuff. In fact, I probably do more now. I'm starting to do more now at 40 than I did, you know, between, like, 27 and now right and uh and i'll have people come up to me and i'm just a silly goose all the time like my kids are like geez that's my dad you know and and uh but people awesome. people came up when it when i was 40 like when i turned 40 and they and no no disrespect to them or anything but they make jokes and it's like everybody expects to get old and I, for some reason, don't expect to get old. And I think that's why I like seeing your post. You're like, I'm 51 years old, and you know, you're still out there doing slams like that. Like that was a year ago, right? You know, just before you were yeah, 50, I guess, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, you, yeah, you're slamming like that, and you know, people are like, why would you do that at 50? You're supposed to be sitting in a rocking chair somewhere watching TV, right? I mean, I mean, if that. I, look, if, if, if that's how you, however you want to spend your life, you know what I mean? Like, it's your life, you know? Like, I mean, if you're, like, doing something stupid, that's you're going to, you know, most people would say, hey, man, you probably shouldn't do that. Or if you're addicted to some stuff, then you probably be like, hey, man, you probably need to get some help. But for the most part, you live your life however you want to live it, you know? And I saw this documentary um, about Colonel Sanders, uh, the guy that invented KFC on the road years ago. I'm sure you can find it online somewhere. I, this is before, like, online was, like, the go-to. You know what I mean? It's like, this some shit I saw on, like, USA Network or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> and this dude, okay, Colonel Sanders, I'll break it down real quick. He was, like, some old-school dude that tried to invent shit his whole life, from what I can remember of the documentary. And he came up with this, this recipe, Colonel Sanders' chicken. He wrote it on the wall in his house up top. And so he, and at this point, he's like 60 years old or some shit. He's not, you know, he's not like he's 20. And so then he starts putting a deep fryer in the back of his Buick and going to the diner saying, do you want to carry exclusive Colonel Sanders chicken? I was like, this dude is punk rock. He didn't even know what punk rock is, he's punk rock. <laughs> which, let me, which, which punk rock is more than just a dress code, okay? That's all I have to say. It's anyway, not, yeah, yeah, and, not a dress code. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyhow, I'm like, yeah, this is punk, you know, he's doing shit. And it turns out that, like, at the time, McDonald's was booming, and then, you know, all of them started to pop up, the franchises were like, we'll do uh, Taco Bell, uh, we'll do a uh, uh, chicken one, we'll do, uh, you know, everybody's just competing with each other and trying to come up with, like, something new. So anyhow, he, he came up with that whole character where he dresses in white, dyed his beard white, he didn't dress like that. That was from off of some cartoon strip they used to watch or some shit. Like, and then he came up with Colonel Sanders, the whole spit, the whole spew, fucking at like 60, 70 years old, and finally cracked and hit an invention of his. And I was like, damn, this dude, well, most dudes are grandpas and shit, like, you know, hey, cut the turkey, watching football, not doing shit. He's like, put a, put a deep fryer in the back of a Buick, you know what I'm saying? Hey, carry my chicken and shit, DIY. I'm like, this dude is punk as fuck. Like, and that stuck with me, and I was like, man, never give up on your dreams. Never give up on what you want to do. You're never too old. You could have more than one dream. You know what I'm saying? You could, ha- you could, you could do more than one thing. And that's why I was got so inspired. Is I was like, yo, this dude was just like going for it. And uh, anyone out there? listening to this, I, I don't remember the name of the documentary. I don't know. I'm sure if you Google, like, documentary on Colonel Sanders, it'll probably pop up. But uh, I, that inspired me. And that inspired me to say, like, dude, you know what? This is how old you are. Uh, you know, you, uh, you 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 got a vision, you got an idea, and, and you follow through. You know? You go for it. So. Well, yeah, and that obviously bleeds through with stuff because 
Uh, I've done a little bit of public speaking before, but you're uh, you're going up there like you decide. When did you get into stand up comedy? About a year and a half ago, and then I started doing really good up until COVID. And then when COVID hit, naturally, like I live out here, I live out here in Hollywood, in, in LA, so like everything shut down, you know, and so like. You know, everybody knows we're having COVID. Everything just got shut down. Then just started to open back up. But then I started to say, okay, like, you still write material and you still want to perform. I just haven't performed in quite a while. Uh, like I said, I did a set at the comedy store uh, maybe a week before COVID. And then, and then the, the, uh, I take that back uh, in the Valley. Like, the day before COVID, like, really, like, they shut everything down, I did a set. And it just... But the thing about stand-up comedy is this, bro. You perform in front of people that want to laugh, you're going to make them laugh. If you if you go to open mic night and you perform in front of other comics that are just running through material, you might not get laughs. Because everybody's there just to spit their shit. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Everybody's competing with, everybody's competing with each other. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like a bunch of bike riders hanging out. We're at a skate park. There we go. Compare it back to bike riding. Bunch of bike riders hanging out. We'd be like, "Oh, that was sick." We're not going to be over the top applauding and shit. If you like some dude in the X Games crowd, like that was sick. Ah! You know what I mean? Like, so when you're performing for an audience, it's different than when you're performing for the same people doing the same thing. You know, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense. Like, I mean, you know, you're. I I can see that totally now. I always tell people like it's not like what you see. I mean, I've been fortunate enough just to be around like like some high level action sports people like yourself, you know, and, and watch what you do and just in awe. And I'm like, it's not like that at all. When you're in that position, it's like they're, they're doing the most gnarly things that you don't normally see on videos because they're all one upping each other. And they're just, it's like goes one after the other, but there's no like crowd cheering. There's, you know, it's just all, it's like, Oh, you either hit it or you don't. Yeah, like, and there'll be some camaraderie, but it doesn't, it's like, oh, sick, or someone be like, what? That was rad. And the two, you know, I just say that your friends aren't supportive. Of course they are. And not to say that, that other comics, when you're doing open mics, won't be supportive. Of course they are. Some aren't. Some aren't. I've had, I've had one comic tell me, like, basically told me, like, that I wasn't going to stand up comedy, I should stick to bikes. <laughs> and it was funny because I, because I was like, I just told him, I'm like, that's funny because your set totally sucked. <laughs> and and you you know like you didn't get any laughs I got laughs from people competing to get laughs like what are you talking about dude and you know that's one thing I'll, I, I must say that I have to mention as much as you have a, a you know the blessing of like I'm gonna go for this shit I'm gonna do whatever it takes there's also kind of a curse to it and what I mean by that is is that a lot of times when people know you okay and I, I don't mean this doubtfully if it sounds this way I don't mean it to sound that way but there's a lot of times when people know you for one thing, okay? Like, they know you for bike riding. They're, they're, uh, it's hard for them to accept that you could actually be good at something else. It's hard for them to detach what they found you as, the bike rider, and now you're the musician, or the host, or the actor, or the, I got a cooking show with my son, a chef. It's hard for people to detach that. And so then they want to attack it because I think most people believe that they can only be good at one thing. And I've always said you can be good at multiple things if you put in the work. And, you know, I, I face that a lot. I face that a lot with people um, with, you know, either, either someone like yourself is like real enthusiastic and stoked, like, God, you're doing more shit than just bike riding. And other people are competitive. And, and they're like, well, he's pretty good at this too. And he's good at that. And he's good at this. Fuck him. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a little of me used to be like that. I did. Until I started going for it. A little of me used to be like jealous when, when someone, say, started a band and was a pro athlete. I'm like, dude, because that's what I wanted to do. And instead of getting jealous and talking crap, you just apply yourself. You say, oh, I'm just going to go for it. And, and uh, do my thing. You know, and... and do, do what you got to do, you know? I mean, look, when I, when I started when I started hosting TV shows back in the day, everyone says, what, you're not a bike rider now? I was like, no, I can do both. And then when I started doing radio, 
studied radio for ESPN for nine years. Oh, wow. I started doing, yeah, when I started doing radio, it was called ESPN Action Sports Radio. And they used to play it out here on the radio on, on uh, KLS. And then this is, this is like when podcasts first started popping off, dude. And they, I used to go around with the MP3 player and a mic and interview people at events and shit all day long. You can look it up online. I'm sure it's still on iTunes. It's called EXPN Action Sports Radio. Got it. And uh, so then I started doing radio, and people were like, what, you don't host TV shows anymore? I was like, wait a second. Wait, you were just asking me if I still wrote because I was TV, and you all forgot all about life now? And then I started doing movies. They're like, what, so you don't do radio anymore? I was like, that's just people. And I get it, and I'm not offended by it, and you can't let that get in your way. But I will just say at times, people like the guy at this, at this open mic, we're just, dude, I've seen some of the best comedians run through, through material, and it sucks. And that's why they go to open mics, to go through material, to see what works and what doesn't work. Not but, everything you say is going to be funny. Isn't it? It's, all, it's that same thing with anything else, though. Like, you have to fall and fail to learn what works, like, to learn how to do that exact thing. You can, you can read or study or watch all day long until you actually go out and do it and keep getting those repetitions and the muscle memory or the, you know, train, you can train your brain to think faster and talk faster and, you know, react quicker. And I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that too. Like how quick and sharp the stand up comedians are on, like when people say things in the crowd and just all that, it's all a trained muscle from doing it over and over again and sucking. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And also too, I will say this, anyone out there that wants to get into stand up comedy, and, and go for it. Well, for me, what I learned right off the bat, jokes with my friends might not be funny and, and a group room full of people. Because you have a relation because you have a relationship with your friends. Yeah. Like homie may laugh at your jokes because you've known them since third grade. But the reality is it's really not that funny. But you're gonna think you're funny because your homies are laughing. The reality the shit ain't funny. Just saying. And and that's what happened to me as I was like, okay, and you learn how to shift gears real quick, like, all right, enough of that, let's talk about this. And uh, so it's just fun, man. It's just fun. I, I believe that all of like, I believe that like all of the, uh, you know, industries are connected somewhat, some sort, like from the music to the sports to the uh, television, radio, comedy, it's all entertainment. It's just different, different, different language and different, different uh, formulas that you have to learn. Man. You know, like when I started doing movies, when I started doing movies, uh, that was different than hosting. So I went into it with a hosting mentality. Had not, acting has nothing to do with hosting. At all. At all. Unless you're playing a host in a movie. <laughs> different. But you think, oh, I'm in front of a camera. The same thing. No. Uh, and so I went to school. I went to acting school for three years out here and studied that. And so it's not as if, like, you stumble into things. You're like, oh, I'll do that. It's like you got to study this stuff. And if you want to be good at it, you know, and practice it. And, uh. And, and that leads me to my next thing I want to mention real quick. Next year, uh, I'm going to be playing a cop in this movie. I got a movie part I'm pretty stoked in about, actually. That's uh, awesome. What's what's the movie? Uh, the movie, I mean, I can't talk all about it. That's the only thing that sucks. They make you sign these, these like, uh, what are they, NDAs, non-disclosure agreement things. But yeah. I just want to say that, like, the, the, the movie is going to be pretty rad. Um, it's got a lot of... A lot of a lot of well-known people in it and I'm pretty stoked because having that skill and learning how to act is something that you have while you do the other stuff. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Like, like you're lucky to act, I mean like big acting, not like independent films, like like major motion pictures. Those type of actors may work a lot but there's a, I think there's a lot of actors that don't work that much, you know? And you got to do other things when you're not acting. And so that's why I'm like, oh, well, we got bike riding. Oh, we got music. Oh, we got radio. We got this, we got this, ah, and all this stuff, you know? So I ne- people always ask me, like, what are you been up to? I'm like, yeah, I don't know where to start. Like, it goes from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. But I like it. I just feel like I'm always busy, you know? Yeah, but you're always busy with things but, that you like to do. Like, you chose to do those things. Yeah, but it all stemmed from writing, man. I'm telling you. So none of it. All of it's rad, all of it's rad, but I will say that, and I love all the other stuff, it's fun. The feelings are great, the feelings are different, but the ultimate feeling, 
for me still to this day would be pulling something on your bike that you wrote down on a piece of paper that you thought you could do, but you didn't know how you were going to do it, but you did it. That's yeah, cr- Man. I mean, make, but making people laugh's fun. Acting's fun. Like, uh, music's a blast. Music's real close to the same. Cause you rock the crowd, you get, to get your emotions out. Rah! And bike riding, you don't really talk. It's all like a physical expression, you know? Um, so, yeah, man. Anyways, I'm just rambling, but yeah, it's fun. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. dude, it's awesome. Like, so there's so many lessons in there for like everybody. It is you don't have to be, uh, you know, a BMX rider or an action sports star on the level that you are, or an actor or stand up comedian. You don't have to be somebody like that. You can have a regular, you know, just regular nine to five job and come home to your family and all that. But you can apply these things to your life. Like, even if it's if you want to start your own business. You know, you want to, you've got these dreams or you want this specific job in this industry and that's where you'd be happy, but you're over here and you just like, well, I can't go. I've got a family. I got kids. I've got these things to worry about. Like, no, I think you can go. You just have to start making a plan and work for it and do it. I don't, I, I have a, I, I want to spread message to everybody like that's like struggling with stuff that they can find things like they can di- like you don't have to settle. I guess is what I'm saying. Like whatever your path is in life, you don't have to settle. And that's what's impressive about what you've done. You're like, I want to try stand-up comedy. I'm going to go for it. You know, I I'm gonna, I want to try acting. I'm going to go for it. Like, and you give it 100% and nobody's in there. Like nobody's in Rick's head saying like, oh, what about you can't? Like, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm a bike rider. Well, I think, well, I think, I think a lot. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think a lot of it too, and I agree with what you're saying. If you, it's what you focus your attention on, dude. It's focus what you focus your thoughts and your speech on. You know, you said something that's like uh, sparked something that I always say is like all these people fighting over these politicians. It's all you're talking about. It's all you're thinking about. If you're not talking about starting a business, are you? Are you talking about bettering your life? Are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like I just, I, I refuse to fight over it. I refuse to fight over it. And I refuse to watch it. And so I keep my focus in my own world, in my own head of what I need to do. And, and you know, where you focus your attention and your speech is what you get. And it's a known fact, and that's how your subconscious mind works. What you think and say is what you get. Even if you say things you don't want, you will get them. Because that's where you're focusing all your energy and your time in, your thoughts. It's your thoughts and your speech Listen, your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between hot or cold, high or low, rich or poor. It only knows what you say. It goes off your speech and your thoughts and it directs you and steers you down the road of life. Do some research. Study it. I've studied that too. Look up Napoleon Hill. Look up, look up, uh, 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 what's your name? Uh, Esther Hicks. Talk about the law of attraction. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, Napoleon Hill wrote Think and Grow Rich. He also did, he's a master of, of PMA, Positive Mental Attitude. It, it's it's where you put your thoughts. If you keep telling yourself you can't do something, you're gonna you're not gonna do it. And no matter what I say, or no matter what everyone else says, or no matter what you like, what you go read or not read, but no matter like what you see, if deep inside you are telling yourself you can't do something, you're not gonna do it. I don't care what it is. I'm just saying. Dude, that might Make be it, that know. might be some of the best piece of advice I could ever hear. Or you could ever share right there, or this podcast even has on it is that you were saying like if you're arg- you're arguing about these politicians obviously that's a big hot button topic right now with crazy people fighting about everything but you're you are you hit the nail on the head you're spending all your time arguing about these politicians you don't have anything to do with are you starting your business that you've been dreaming about are you like what are you doing like what you're doing nothing but sitting there wasting your energy yeah, like, like, like what I've learned in life, and some people say, you're selfish. I think that that, that word growing up has been like used in a way to attack somebody to say, hey, buddy, can you help me on Friday? I can't. Come on, man, can you help me on Friday? I can't. What about Saturday? I can't. Why not? I got plans. Well, what was your plan? Oh, well, you went to the lake with your buddies. Well, your friends would be like, that dude's selfish. He didn't help me move, right? It's, made, it's kind of a fine line one. And you'd be like, well, I've already made this plan to do this, but I don't have time to do that. I can't do that for you. So I'm going to say you're just selfish. 
Or if someone wants something out of you you can't give them, they call you selfish. Now just follow me. I'm not saying that being inconsiderate and not helping your friends is cool. I'm not saying that's cool. Of course, you help your friends when you can. You help people when you can. But what I've learned by being a people pleaser my whole life, what I've learned by being that guy, especially in three marriages, is that I need to take care of me first. That I was put on this earth to take care of me first. Otherwise, I can't take care of anyone. So I can't go through life people pleasing people, doing this, doing this. And if, if I can't do it, I can't do it. Do you know what I'm saying? And I had a big problem with that. And I had to learn about what the word selfish was. Is that selfish isn't a bad word. It's just used like, like, I mean, look, dude, you put on this earth to live whose life? I'm not living the guy walking up the sidewalk right now's life. I'm living mine. Doesn't mean that I don't care about other people. It does. It gets so twisted. Like it doesn't mean that like I I uh, only care about myself and no regard for other people. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that I have to take care of me first. But I come first. And I think if more people put themselves first in their lives, they could accomplish their goals and dreams of what they want to do. That's just my opinion. No, they that's use that. That's. More, that's used as a guilt thing all the time. Like it's used as a guilt thing to say like you're selfish or call somebody selfish. It's like, man, a real you know you know who your real friends are. It, uh, that it, and when people say that, you're yeah. like, that that's just a that's a thing to try to guilt you into doing what they want, which is in turn selfish as well. Well, which a hundred percent. And so, like our society has so much guilt, blame, lace, left, left and right, and this, that, and the other. I mean, you know, it's just kind of like. For me, and I'm only talking about this because I'm reminding my subconscious mind right now that this is just just discussion. This isn't how, like, my daily. I don't drive around talking about this. I mean, like, like uh, uh, you know, about other other stuff that I keep staying on my path is what I'm trying to get at. Like, I'm just reminding myself that, like, you can do whatever you want in life. It's your life, okay? This is, this is your gift, okay, and how you want to spend it. But the people that I've learned that are successful and follow through with what they want to do, they keep their mind on it. They keep their mind on that, not all the other distractions. The distractions pull you away from what you need to do. That's all I'm saying. And, and I also believe that some people maybe feel clearer, like not, not like I'm not trying to go like weird, but like they're not clouded when they're doing something like, say, bike riding. I've seen so many bike riders in my time be so natural and so good and it, it was so effortless and they were without trying because the way they felt about what they were doing, there was nothing blocking them. You know what I'm saying? And they were like so natural, you could say, but like, but like really it was more kind of like they weren't clouded in what they were doing and this, their expression on their bike was just so rad. And for me on the flip side, I've had to train myself to be like that because I grew up in like a, uh, uh, you know, um, not to throw my family under the bus uh, by any means. I grew up single mom, she worked in a factory, then I had a stepdad. I grew up living, while well, we grew up, there was like, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of, uh, my mom was the only one that was positive, let's put it that way. There's a lot of negativity and a lot of self-doubt. And I, I learned all that through bike riding as well, you know, to feel that feeling it gives you to feel about yourself. Does that make sense? I'm all over the place right now. No, but no, no. But to make a point. you bring up something really interesting, though, with this, is that you're such a positive... I mean, just follow you on social media. You can tell, like, you're you're naturally a positive guy. Like, you, cannot, you can't be a negative guy and be an action sports guy most of the time because you're never going to land a trick because you're always going to think that you're going to fall or things aren't going to go right or whatever. Right. So you have to be a right, positive right, right. guy. So in, I, I'm... I'm curious to know if you think you went that direction because of all the negativity that you had, you know, then, or if you had to teach yourself that later on in life, or if it really was just like, was it just the bike riding? Like once you found something you love to do that it flipped your world around. Um, I think with riding was just one of those things where, I mean, we're talking like, you know, I mean, I was born in 69. So started riding bikes, like, you know, Six, seven years old or something but it wasn't until I like really started jumping and stuff maybe around 10 that I could just get out of the house and just go ride around and it, it felt good and I felt like I had something that was mine that like 
you know, I moved a lot as a kid, uh, you know, single parent, uh, was out of shape, uh, didn't have much friends, because it, it was hard to establish friends when you're going in and out of school all the time. Um, so I think just with riding was one of those things where I was like, this is cool. I just get on and get out. I'm out. And, and I wanted to get out. I wanted to get out all the time. And so, I don't know, like, I, I guess your question was, did I apply the positivity? I, I think I learned a lot of the positivity by setting goals through bike riding. That, like, negativity was something that I used to battle for a long time growing up. Um, and I had to prove to myself that I had a self-worth. I had to prove to myself that uh, I could do something. I could have proved to myself that I could like myself. And I wasn't always born this way. That that I... I uh, I, I trained myself, or I wouldn't say trained, but like through experience of life and trial and error, uh, I learned all those things about liking myself and about accepting who I am and, and not, not having to always have the need to be accepted, to, to feel like uh, some form of validation of some sort, you know, or to have that attention. You know what I mean? Changed quite a bit over the years. This is what happened. I got divorced for the third time, and I'm like, what am I doing? I got two kids. I, you know, everything that I can't say everything, but you know, I'm, I'm a Midwest kid from Kansas City. Uh, I made it all the way to Beverly Hills. Lived there for, for ten years. Had to let it all go. Had to let everything go. Had to start over. Uh, I moved into a 900 square foot apartment with two kids, two dogs, and a cat. No family help out here. So what am I gonna do? Like, it was hard letting go of those possessions. I think, and I will say on a side note, I think that's one of the reasons why I ride a lot of empty pools. They go into these houses. And I, I don't go in the house, but we go ride the pools and you look at the house, you're like, when I mean, the house is done, it's like abandoned, you know? And you're thinking like, it all goes. I mean, not to say don't enjoy it while you're here, but like, don't, don't hold on to things. You know what I mean? Like, at some point in time, you're like, at the end of your life, you have to let go of all of it anyways. So just enjoy it while you got it, you know what I mean? And I think that's why I started riding pools, because I was like, wow, I should like the houses, and you start visualizing, like, this person had this, and this person had that, and they probably thought they had life was made, and now it's just like, shit. I'm just saying. It's waiting to be torn down. And I learned a lot, because I, was, I had a hard time letting go of stuff. So like, I worked out my whole life for this, I gotta let go of this, uh, it's hard for me. And, uh, and so what I did was, to, get to, 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 to answer your question long form, it, I started to do research on, no one told me, I didn't see a psychologist, I didn't see a counselor, but I was like, man, I guess I'm making the same mistakes. I wonder if there'd be a way to reprogram my thinking. Not completely, but like, it had some stuff that I knew I was and I wanted to change, but I didn't know how to go about doing it. And that's when I started to study the subconscious mind, how it never goes to sleep. It only gets what you say and think, what you tell it. It steers you down the road, all that. And that started looking to the law of attraction. And I started to absorb this stuff. And then I said, wait a second. If the subconscious mind never goes to sleep, that makes sense. Why they said never go to sleep in front of the TV. Because you're listening to all that shit. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find things that I like that help me, that I think I need to improve on, like fear of abandonment, or abandonment issues, fear of being alone, people pleasing, guilt, self guilt, all this shit that was just laced on me, okay, that I was venting through bike riding. It just was piled up through the years. I'm gonna get rid of this shit. And how I did it was, I would listen to audiobooks while I slept. My subconscious mind is listening the whole damn time. And people are like, you're crazy, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I'm not, dude, it works. Listen, over the course of time, I would go and to meet somebody. They're not in a relationship, just meet someone. Like on the street. And, wow, she's kind of cute. And, oh, wow. And then I would see, I would see red flags that I've never seen before. I'd be like, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm good. Because the old me would be afraid to be alone and would put myself in situations that would cause so much more damage to my life than just getting over being alone. Does that make sense? And what I'm saying is, not to be alone, like, I'll be alone, the old man, my house, all stuff. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, it's okay. It's okay. Focus on you, and you'll blow your own mind. 
You understand what I'm saying? Dude, so, that's that's, that's so. I, that's what I. That's what I did, man. You know. That's so wild that you. So you feel the difference when you listen. Like you felt a difference in your body when you listen to that audio book while you're sleeping. I don't, no, I don't feel a difference in my body. No, and the first time around, you listen to audio books. So like, okay, I'm healed. Okay, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> no, this is like continual over and over and over repetition, repetition, repetition. And I get to the point now where I don't have to do it. You know, I guess I guess no, what I, I, I I guess I said that like a little bit wrong. So I, I, what I'm saying, you feel the difference like in your life now, and your demeanor, and your attitude, and the way you act, and like from the constant like listening to those things. Like you you can tell because you're like you're very emphatic that this yeah. works. I mean, it works for me, and I always say that because I don't want anybody like saying, "Well, you said to do this, and it didn't work," <laughs> and so no. This works for me, okay? This is what I did for me that I figured out for me. Everybody, like I said, everybody's going to have their own. If there's something about your life you want to change, I'm not here. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, okay? I'm just telling you what works for me. And what I did was, that's exactly what I did. I listened to audiobooks, and over the course of time, I'm talking like years, dude. I'm not talking like two months or whatever. And I had, you know, I had my kids, when I would have my kids, I would, I would sometimes sleep with my headphones on because I have my kids more during all these years. And I don't want them to listen to this stuff. You know what I mean? And so, but it was the bad stuff. But, but yeah, 100%. I'm way more comfortable being by myself. Almost to the point where it can be bad. <laughs> but like, uh, I go ride, I do my thing, I do this, this. Uh, you get lonely. You want, a, you, want, you want a relationship, you want a companionship, but you don't want to just jump into what you had before. Because I did that, and I kept doing that, and I kept doing that, and it, it got the same result. You know, there is a thing that says, that quote, you know, do, do something over and over again with a different result of insanity. I can go with relationships too, bro. Okay? Like, not just like, you can go for it. That, I think that you can use that quote on anything. And... You know, even competing. Let's go, let's backtrack. Uh, I go do the same run I've been doing 25 years with a different result. That's insanity. I'm just saying. For me. For me. So, so yeah, I felt a big difference. And I got to the point where, I guess, not necessarily you could say, well, then that car's squeaking like, you need to change the brakes. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not to the point where I'm like, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I will say this. From how I felt now, right now, than what I did like, you know, eight years ago, day and night, day and night, because there's some things I will never do again, ever, and 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 there's and there's some things that I've learned, and I and I, and I also learned through having kids too. That helps you learn real quick, like, but um, yeah, I, I, there's a big difference in, in me, and and I think I think that like. And you become more fearless, and you become your own best friend, and you, uh, you, uh, I, and I don't want to paint the picture that I'm some like dude that doesn't like to be around people that 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 that's that some you know outcast just wants to, you know do. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I, I kept finding myself damaging myself, and it was more just always looking for that that relationship, and always put myself in in situations in relationships and marriages that was just a pattern that I just had to stop and I needed to take care of my kids and I needed to be strong and I needed just to overcome some things that I felt like that I never confronted myself. And listen, I, I'm not a drug addict. I've never done drugs. I don't know what it's like to be a drug addict or an alcoholic. But I will say that when, when I was going through that period where I was really focused on looking at myself, it was uncomfortable. And... It was uh, it was a little uneasy at times, and when I felt my body started to shift and let go of things that I thought I needed that I don't need, it was uncomfortable at first letting go of those things. Does that make sense? Heck yeah, it does, dude. And yeah, I'm I'm fascinated. Yeah. I'm I, like it's really it's really cool that you found something and you did it for years, like that. You said that you you listened to those audiobooks over years. Like I wasn't expecting that long, 
of a time frame, but you stuck with that. Like you really hung in there on your your idea of just this positive message to yourself day in and day out. Yeah, well, thanks, man. And for me, I did the audiobook thing because, you know, I, I can listen to those while I'm driving too, but sometimes my mind is that I'll be listening and then you start thinking a bike trick or thinking something else. And then uh, reading, I, I'm just, I've always been, uh, I, I'm always fascinated by people that can just sit there and, and read a book and go through it and be stoked and pick up another one. Um, I, I, I kind of I get really tired when I start reading. I've always been that way even as a kid. And so... Uh, I felt like the audiobook was a way for me. That way, my brain has my absolute 100% attention because I'm sleeping, you know, I'm not going anywhere. And if my subconscious mind's still awake, well, log in information, you know, it's listening. And uh, I even got into this, like, I think it's Hertz frequency for healing. I think like four, is it 435, three, I'm trying to remember what it was. But there's different frequencies you can listen to while you sleep that help with healing and, and negative vibes and stuff. And I would play that stuff for my kids, too. Like, we'd sleep and we just put on this music. You can find it online on YouTube. I think it's like 435 hertz. It's a different frequency for healing. I got into it. Got into it, yeah. But I don't need to do that stuff anymore. I healed myself. I know the difference now. I applied it. I applied it. I'm not perfect. But I applied it to the degree where I'm like, eh, I don't need to make those, those choices like that. I make better choices. You know? <laughs> okay. You know? You know what's so, like, and, uh, what makes yeah. this so, what makes this so crazy, too, is that you've done all this stuff, like, you, like this is incredible, like, it's great stuff for people to hear, to constantly be working, like, working to improve yourself. Like, you saw holes in where you need to improve and you went after it. And people might say this is some hippy dippy crap that you're you like spitting on and 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 they had, but then you go on stage and you're screaming punk rock music to a crowd and then you get on your bike and you're riding like you're listening to punk rock music just flying around the bowl and like it's 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 really cool how you can you can manage to switch and have both things and I think that's one fascinating thing about like people that are successful and stuff, they have this ability to to do stuff like that. Like they separate the art from and what they do and what they love from in, in different zones. Like they can appreciate the flowers and also appreciate the violence. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but I wouldn't been able to, to. You know, you you we need to back up for a second. Remember talking about how you want to keep writing and stuff. There's a lot that goes with that, like to keep writing, and this is another part of it. Another part of it that I mentally had to fix to 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 uh, heal myself in some areas. Just like in order to keep writing, you got to watch your weight. It changes. Your body changes, bro. Your metabolism does slow down. I don't care what anyone says. I used to not believe it. I'm like, nah, no, it does. <laughs> and then and then you're like, okay. And then you got to like stay, stay uh, uh, don't don't get tight, meaning like don't get full attention in your body. Don't let the emotion, the emotions, emotions are worse than physical on your body. Emotional tension causes more damage. People are like, oh, you're full of it. No, it does. I'm telling you, when, when you, when you fall, like I've, I've also practiced through the years, a lot of, uh, massage therapy, but more kind of like, see, when I first moved to Orange County in 97, I'm like, I want to start getting massages. Everyone thought like I was the hippy dippy dude. Like, you're going to get massages. <laughs> and I found this guy in Orange County. This Vietnamese guy he became one of my best buddies not over time. Uh, I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but I've seen him over the last 20 years. Okay. And he's helped me with like so much of way of thinking, perception, turned me on to like drinking ionized water, to a number of things. So, what I'm getting at is what I was saying about like how you can keep riding. It's more layered so much deeper than just like, can I make the money to do this? I got to eat the right food. I got to keep my mind right. I got to keep my body right. It's a, it's a daily practice. And so he taught me how to acknowledge pain and accept it and therefore to leave your body. If you protect the pain, you're protecting it. It's not going to go anywhere. 
And this guy's so badass. Like, such a philosopher. And it was just a random dude that I found uh, back even when he still looked in the yellow pages, bro. Okay, it's 97. Okay, it wasn't that long ago. You couldn't Google, like, where <laughs> businesses are. Remember, we had to still look in the yellow pages? Yes. And I was yeah. like, and you know what I mean? I was like, yo, like, what's up? And we became really good friends over time. And, like, he's helped me a lot to where I don't need to see him anymore. I know how to work on myself. I know when I fall, boom, shake it off. I know to shake that tension off. I know, like, how to, and that, see, and, and, and that's probably why I was stubborn about the broken ribs thing and the accident at Warped Tour is because I felt like I could take care of myself. I guess there's a point where you can't, but for the most part on a daily basis, I know how to release tension in my legs, my calves, and my body and my spine, align myself to keep my body uh, uh, loose. Because what happens is if your body gets tight and you fall, it breaks. You know, so flexibility is like a lot of it. And so by keeping that flexibility into your 50s, until you get older, that not only doesn't help you with riding, it helps you with so many things. And like, and I will say this, bro, and I'm rambling like crazy, expression, expressing yourself really keeps you loose. It really keeps you alive. It keeps you like, like, I don't know, it, keep, it keeps you young feeling, like young spirit and like expressing yourself as an individual. And, and that's why I do all of these things express myself to have my own voice to have my own creativity to to and I, and I don't think I'm anything extra special I think anybody in this world could do anything if they really want to but I will say that just by expressing yourself in a way that's positive you really it really helps you a lot man it helps it helps your mind and your soul your body you know it does well that's it does me at least I mean None of none of what you say or whatever you put out ever comes off like to, from the outside. This is like a dude that's just a fan that didn't know you before this phone call, and we literally said like what maybe five or six words before we started this podcast. Um, none of it comes off ever like you're thinking like you're something special. Like you literally, it literally comes off like you're like, hey everybody, come join the party, man. Look what we're, look what you can do. Like you can do anything you want. Like look what I'm doing. That means anybody can do anything they want. Like that's the way it comes off. Yeah. Like I, I feel when I watch yeah. your videos, dude. Even when you, even when you, you've got the one where your teeth are out and your face is all busted up. I'm like, dude, I want to go do something right now. Oh, dude, you're talking. Oh, hell yeah, dude, that's rad. You're talking about that photo. Yeah, listen, man, I forgot to mention. Okay, so after I got hurt with that lung in the hospital, I started filming for my 50 of 50, and I fell and got knocked out. And I busted my face and broke my teeth. I have four fake teeth anyways. And everybody was like, what the fuck? What did you just do? I'm like, dude, I'm trying to get this 50 of 50 done. And I slammed and knocked my teeth out. My face is all bloody. And they're like, dude, you shouldn't even be riding. Like, is your lung even healed? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. They're like, dude. So I had back-to-back injuries, but I needed to get that 50 of 50 done, and I did. And I was the first to do it. So, yeah, that was the own personal goal. Like, yo, let's get I mean, I used to, dude, we used to go all the time on the road. And just be like, I used to ride, but I got old. And like, how old are you? I'm 19. I'm like, dude, you're not old. <laughs> you're 19. But you're, maybe, I get it. Where some people live, they feel like they're old because they're forced into, like, the, the family life and the marriage and the work right away because that's their environment. I get it. I understand it. I think a lot of that's changed in society because of the internet. And people are like, hey, I don't need to run out and have a family right away. I can live a little bit of life, you know, um, or a lot of bit of life. And so, uh, yeah, man, so I, I, I had a rough, that, that was a rough slam, but whatever. Just keep it moving. Dude, but that, you- I was talking about that one. I was at the park by myself, dude. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And my GoPro was just running, and you see dudes come down and go like, "Dude, you all right?" And I got my van and drove home. And as I'm driving home, I'm like, "This is a great intro to my 50 of 50." <laughs> oh, dude, you can't even. It doesn't. Even, you're like, man, your face all busted up, and you're as happy as you can be in the video. It looks like you're like, "Hey, man." <laughs> I'm like, "Yo, I just slammed. You can do anything, bro." Like, you're just like, you're out of your mind. I'm like, "No, I'm not, dude." Listen, nobody lives forever, okay? When I was younger, my mom, she had two brothers die in car accidents, and she got divorced. And then she, she was working in a bar, and like, before she, 
she worked at Wonder Bread Bakery for like 30 years or whatever. Horrible life. Hor- on a horrible life, a horrible job for a woman. Factory life sucks for a woman. I don't care. Even for a man. It's a gnarly job, okay? And, and I, you know, I was just like always grateful, you know? And but, but before that happened, my mom, she used to go to the, to the cemetery at night, the graveyard. And we had to stay the night there. And I remember the first time being like, this is fucked up, crying and shit, scared, huh? dead people everywhere. Like, what am I doing? This is in the 70s, dude. Things are different. You can, you can go into the graveyard at 2 in the morning. No one would even question you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, until Ed Gein fucked it up. You know who he is? He's a dude from Milwaukee. That's who the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about. But it's not Texas Chainsaw. It's Ed Gein. He used to dig up bodies and make lampshades out of skins and shit. Give him flesh. Yeah, look him up. Crazy. Anyways, that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is, <laughs> I remember sitting there and leaning against the tombstone going, this is where I end up? All right. Okay. Well, let's get busy. You're man. Like, what? Like, oh, let's start living life. And I was maybe, I was maybe eight years old, man. If that. Not, not nine, nine or so. I remember that. Like, I'm like, I don't know what it is I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. Because if this is where my body at least ends up, like this is the, the end result to all of this, well, I'm going to have to go uh, uh, motivated. I know it sounds uh, morbid to some people. They're like, dude, this is shit. No, I got motivated. I was like, all right, cool. Nothing to lose. Let's go. Enjoy it while you're here. You know? Yeah, dude, that's that's so, it's so great. It's awesome. How you've done that? I think you you've got an awesome message that can help. Like people just need to follow you on your Instagram, your social media. They need to watch. Man, the- I, listen, I, I, I thank you, but let anyone out there, I ain't trying to just preach or change the world or any of that. I'm just saying through experience, through my life, if I could shed any kind of motivation on anybody to help them follow what they love to do or feel good about themselves and realize that life is so short, live it and feel good while you're here. Then that that served my purpose. I'm like I said, I'm not trying to be like. The dude that's like telling people what to do, think I'm better, preaching, self righteous, any of that bullshit. Not at all. I'm just saying through my own trials and errors and tribulations and light and experiences, what I've learned is we aren't here very long. Let's make the best of it. That doesn't mean go do stupid shit. That means if you got an idea or a vision or a dream, you got nothing to lose. Go for it. Dude, I love you it. You know what I mean? I love it. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. That's it. And then, then you'll realize if you, by failing if you really want to do it or not. You're like, ah, I think I might want to try this. Or like, you know what? I was right. I'm not good at that. Let me try something else. You know? So, anyways. I love it, man. I'm actually I'm actually sitting up off the Sunset Boulevard right now. I, I ride, uh, I try to ride every now and then, uh, 10 miles. I've been doing this for like this route for 20 years through Hollywood. I ride 10 miles on my bike, my BMX, listen to headphones, good ideas, uh, you know, feel good, uh, no pressure, no stress, no, you know, nothing nothing in the way, I just feel free, I've been doing this since I was a kid, so I've been doing the same ride for like 20 years, since 97, or whatever. That's, I, that's awesome, 10 miles a long way on a BMX. Yeah, but it's fun, dude, you're just kind of bopping around, you just listen to music, or you get, you get ideas, and um, you know, I get ideas for lyrics or ideas uh, all kind because I feel like this is where my mind's the clearest in all this chaos. But my mind's clear. I'm on my bike. It's the feeling it gives me to inspire me is just being on it. It's weird. I don't know. That's just what it is. Dude, people people need to do those sort of things, man. I was in a like I was in a rough spot at one point in time, and I found some like I started getting back into be- the things that I loved instead of you know. Like I pushed them all away for so long because I thought I had to be a certain way, right? Struggling to like right. keep some thir- certain things afloat, you know. And and then I realized like I lost it anyway. So what? Like okay, what do I got? What what happened to me? Like that destroyed me. And so then I started implementing those things that I like to do again. And it say like it turned me back into the same human being that I was. And I, I'm like, oh man, I could share this piece of advice with everybody so i get that totally on that level that that's where you need to go and and more people need whatever hobby or whatever activity or whatever thing that 
that they can go and be 100% in that thing at that moment. That's what they need to, to break away, whether it's an hour, whether it's a couple hours, whether it's 30 minutes. They just need that, that little piece of time where they're in something so 100% that they don't have to, they're, you're not thinking about anything else in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's like they say, you know, uh, your place of like what, uh, I guess serenity or like your place of like, uh, you know, your, you, know, so you, got, you have your special place to go to to think and da, da, da. <laughs> maybe that's it, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, I go down to the lake and I sit here, like the ducks, and that's cool, people, I go fishing, whatever. I mean, I, I like to dodge cars on Sunset Boulevard, hauling ass, listening to Pantera. I'm like so alive and like, ah! I feel good. That's just me, you know. I, I want to mention this real quick before we go. Anyone out there, they might say, oh, well, you're just lucky. You just live in California. Oh, you're just lucky. You just drive bikes. Or you're just like, you have no idea. First off, I just want to say this. I worked in an Olive Garden. I graduated high school in 1987. I got a job working at the Olive Garden. And I worked there for nine years. Sorry, seven years. Seven years. Wait, 97. Wait, 98, 99, 2000. Seven years, Okay. Seven years. And I used to ride my bike to work, lived in my mom's basement, didn't have a car, didn't have a girlfriend. But all I cared about was riding. Back then, we didn't get flown to contests. We didn't even get bike parts. You didn't, get, you didn't get a t-shirt. Are you kidding me? There weren't any, no one was flowing you like three socks, dude. You know what I mean? And so you're like, yo, like, you just loved riding. You wanted to ride. I'd save all my money. I'd go to contests. I'd pay my hospital bills. This, that, whatever. i get a little bit of attention in the industry. I'd, I'd apply it, I'd apply it, I'd be still just set goals, I'd set goals through all the injuries, through everything. And I remember I quit bike riding because of injuries one year. I wouldn't say quit, but I told myself, I'm done. That year I tore my shoulder, my knee, I had to wear a, a, a piss bag for a month because I tore my urethra. Oh yeah, I was a fucking rough year. Oh. I'm like, I'm done. I'm busting tables paying for this shit, paying my way to contests, I ain't making no money unless I do shows. Shows aren't guaranteed, you may do a couple weeks a year or or, you know, a couple months a year, which is fun, it's cool, but, you know, yeah, what am I going to do with my life? And, uh, and I remember I stopped dead in my tracks carrying my bus up at the Olive Garden. I'm like, what the? I quit riding for this? Is this my, is this it? Is this it? Is this, is this where, is this where, is this where, I, is, as far as I'm going to get? You've been doing this for this long and you quit bike riding for this? And that's what I told myself. Start riding again, dude. You just start riding again. Like, like follow your dream. So what if you got hurt? Just get over it, get it fixed, keep moving forward. Like, I didn't shy away, but I, I did for about five months. I was like, I'm done. And then that's when I realized, well, what else am I going to do with my life? I don't like to do it. This is what I like to do. Like, oh, well, I got hurt. Or, oh, well, I got to pay for this. Or, oh, well, who cares? It's all worth it. What am I gonna do? Just fuck tables and then go go get wasted with all everyone else at work at night and then wake up, come back to this job, and then go get wasted and come back to this job. That ain't fulfillment to me. Then fulfillment to me. I was like, Psh. so anyone out there that says, oh, you got lucky or oh, it's just, you have no idea. And one day it'll all be in my book. Yeah, what <laughs> my book? Dude. Do it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Don't use that excuse. And I only say that because I used to use that excuse. And I told you earlier, I used to be jealous of people. And I had to check myself. And when you check yourself, that's what you need to do. I checked myself. You know what I'm saying? No, there's no luck involved. It's all about how bad do you want it. Understand? Heck, dude, for that's sure. It. That's it. <laughs> that's All it right, walk off alright oh, hey uh, let everybody know your band where they can find you and, and all that so they can stay tuned when your movie comes out they'll know when it comes out and all that good stuff okay yeah I mean all my social media is basically Rick Thorne um, it's, it's, uh, with the E at the end so it's Thorne T-H-O-R-N-E um, I, I, like, I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram I mean you know uh, so, some, and I got Facebook and all that and then my website's rickthorne.tv my band is called Good Guys in Black. My cooking show is called Cooking with the Thorns. And I have actually have my own podcast as well called The Rick Thorn Show. Heck yeah, so, dude. I mean, you know what I mean? So just, just staying busy, bro. And so uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk to you. 
and uh, hopefully somebody gets inspired and and does rad things, man. So yeah, hell yeah. Me too. Hey, thanks a lot, Rick. This was a blast, dude. All right, stay rad, brother. Keep jamming.